Here I am, Miss America, Fantasy Island, all those great things that we watched on TV as kids. Some of you are young and know what that is. The love boat making another run today. And we're back after an amazing, amazing, let me tell you how amazing it was. I was in Holland, or should I say AG Amsterdam. Let's start from the beginning. I went to play at Q for Disnotech in Shoreditch. Then on that weekend that I was away, I went to my fellow buddy and good friend from the industry out of Baltimore, Maryland. Sorry about that. Out of Baltimore, Maryland, DJ Spen and his 10-year anniversary at Ministry of Sound. And I got to see Kenny Carpenter, Booker T, Ricky Morrison, Paris Yvette, Neil Pierce, Bobby Lavanier from Bobby and Steve. Of course, our hearts always, he's going to be on this show in November. DJ Romaine, after so long, and so many people, it was like a, a moment of networking beyond networking. Incredible moment. Incredible time at ministry. Barbara Tucker and Crystal Waters come walking in. I'm outside and I hear Lenny Fontana. I was like, oh, my people from America are here. I mean, it was the kind of like that 19, early 90s feeling of hanging out and running into all your friends. So that was that. And then I was blessed. To be invited to this. Let's see if you can all see this. I got invited. Let me show you one last thing. The Mercury Awards. In London. At the Apollo. How awesome is that? I get invited. You know, this is those Forrest Gump moments. I got to sit in the crowd. Amongst all the industry peers, and it's more of independent artists that are on major labels and stuff, and they're not, you know, your top 10 artists. They are the next pieces of the pyramid that are coming up, you know? And to be able to see a production show sitting at that level, like being at a Grammys or any of that, and, and actually visualizing and listening to everybody playing, it was pretty, pretty surreal, pretty cool. And I know, I think it was Little Sims one that night. And I said to, I was with my publishers, Bucks Publishing in the UK. And I said, I want to remix this artist. And I'll leave that for you guys, which you would think I would mix. <laughs> one of the artists is English white girl. She was fierce. R&B song. I was like, wow, incredible, incredible. But feels good to be back. In New York, so that was Tuesday night. We're talking about the whirlwind of how my week went, 11, 12, whatever, 13 days. And then fly Wednesday morning after being out all night Tuesday. Wednesday early morning, catch a flight, thanks to my friend Sarah. It's DJ Sarah Rundell racing me to Gatwick Airport because to try getting a train at 4 o'clock in the morning ain't going to happen. So I got to get, I got to be there at 5 o'clock to get those wonderful easy jet flights. Everybody knows that flew EasyJet. It's like flying Spirit. It's a no frills airline, so you got to get there. Because if you don't get there, you lose your seat. You're buying another ticket. It's not like they're gonna they're gonna bump you to another uh, plane. Ain't that is not possible. So we go, and then I touch down. I meet my partner Manuel and Mike Lafonk and everybody and as soon as i get there in amsterdam it's like i see loads of people in the industry loads of loads of americans loads of europeans loads of uk people so here's my take on it after being with covid and in the pandemic and then coming back and seeing everyone it was so refreshing and so wonderful it was like hey we're all still standing after the fallout 
We made it through. We're on the other side. Not to say that, you know, that this thing is over, but just to have a reprieve and know, hey, we can be alive and still do this. And the clubs were busy. The people were so happy. The streets were crazy. It felt like any other day that when nothing ever happened before with the COVID, you know? Meetings and stuff. Got to see Beatport. I ran into Simon Dunmore. We had a big hug. I congratulated him on his semi-retirement because he's not really retired. <laughs> he's still staying on. But he's no longer going to be running the helm like he was at Defected. So, you know, that was super cool. I mean, I saw so many people. And, of course, whatever I didn't see, I saw on social media. So it was spread out because people were at different places in the city. But the love was strong. House music is breathing better than ever. Soulful house, disco house, and Afro house, all right there. I heard all that music being played. Classic house. It was house and disco all night long, baby. All night long. What's up, Dubs of D? DJ Vibe Entertainment, the Purple DJ. Welcome to the show. We're going today with a special show. I want to give everybody a chance to jump in and explain. And, you know, and from there, I'll tell you really what was amazing. After doing the two nights, Wednesday and Thursday, I flew Friday to Berlin. To play at Paloma. Holy smoke. Sarah Rundell, what's up? I was just talking about you. I don't know if you heard it. About how you sped drove me to the to the um to the train. Uh, to the plane. God bless you. My good friend. I went to play at Paloma in Berlin. I played an eight hour set. Eight hours. House disco. I took these people, and it was a young crowd on a journey. It was packed. It was sweaty. It felt good. Oh, my God. I was, after eight hours, I still could have kept going. I could have kept going till now. That crowd let me have it. I'm going to tell you, man. They asked me this question. When was the last time I played eight hours? I said to them, when was the last time I played? Four hours, no less, maybe three. Most clubs want me in for one, two hours, and it's like, whoa, two hours. That's a big night. When I said eight hours to people, they were like, can you handle that? I'm like, really now? That was normal. You open the club. They had me open to close. Paloma gets my award for it. Super cool spot. Now, and if you know Berlin, if you haven't been there or you haven't been there, Berlin's more techno like Bergheim. That style of club plays a very techno electronic sound. So Paloma, when I got, when I was able to put the first record on and saw the reaction, I stick I even started with low BPM, like real slow, and worked my way up. By the time I played Arnold, jo that classic by Yvonne Turner and Tommy Musto, Yvonne, um, what was it? Arnold Jarvis takes some time out. Holy smoke. Oh, my God. Out, out of control. That place let me have. I could, yo, I could do this all the time. I can do that marathon set with no issues. So enough of that. And I want to thank everyone for sending me all their music, of course. And, you know, we're back in strong. I've been away for a little bit. It's hard to do the show when I'm on tour and moving around. But I'm here. We're not going nowhere. In fact, we're going to have some really big news coming up real soon. So stay tuned. Welcome to True House Stories. I'm Lenny Fontana coming out of New York City. You know, I was blessed in the beginning of this year to get a call from a fellow DJ who himself is a giant in this game, Andy Ward. 
And he asked me about, would I want to play again at Vocal Booth Weekend after being so long away? How would I feel about it? And I was well up for the challenge. I was like, yes, put me down, sign me up. And he says, well, I'm thinking about having Victor Simonelli too and Eric Copper and Maurice. And I really want to do something special, kind of like the welcome back. They did it last year. They did it last year, but they wanted to do something special this year because this is the year where it's going to be a lot easier to fly. The restrictions were up. And the year previous, back in 21, for me to even think about going to Spain to play, I would have had to sit in a hotel for 14 days, then come out of isolation, like being in prison, then be rechecked. And I said, forget that. So, you know, as you've all seen since January of this year, I've been nonstop traveling, going and going. I'm not stopping. I'm not going to ever stop. I'm going to keep on rocking. Anyway, so Andy said, you know, I have this idea. Let me, let me, let me work this all out. And then it developed. And then he asked me, would I consider doing a discussion panel? I said, yeah, why not? I love doing discussion panels. I've done some at ADE in the past for a thousand people in the room. But this is going to be the first time where I've actually brought, brought, my brand, True House Stories, to a live audience sitting in front of us, of course, and having some of these wonderful participants. Now, if you watched the show in the past, you've seen each one. The only one I haven't had on here yet was Sunlight Square, um, Claudio Pasavanti, very talented keyboard player, musician, has his band, and does a lot for different uh, companies and stuff. So he was the fourth addition to the discussion panel. So Andy came out with the idea of all this and said, you know, how would I feel? I said, okay, you know, Andy, I think it's a great thing because I know the people that are coming are going to appreciate this wholeheartedly. And why the hell not? Why not? Let's give them something that they can walk away from. So we had a pretty good amount of people that sat with us for about an hour and 25 minutes. Colin Williams, who is a fantastic DJ himself, photographer, was at the event throughout the whole few days shooting. And we were so blessed that he videoed this great uh, talk discussion. So without me saying anything more, this was in Alicante, Spain at the Vocal Booth Weekender. And you're going to see Victor Simonelli, Maurice Joshua, Eric Cupper, and Sunlight Square each talk about their lives in the music industry, bits and pieces. So for now, let me start the show and let's go to the live showcase that was happening in Alicante. In 1987, I could have been at the Paradise Garage or something. I remember exactly what happened right then and there. 1991, I was there. I remember. Certain people I was around, Victor Simonelli, I was in studio sessions. When he played his record last night, I remember he was mixing that with Jim Bonsai Caruso. Oh, right, right. See what I mean? And I remember that. But meanwhile, Mar Martin Wright comes up and do you remember me, mate? And I went, no. Yes, I do. I talk to you all the time. No, no, that's my rendition, no. But I just started laughing, and I was like, and then I'm embarrassed. Because you start saying to yourself, I mean, are you getting old? Or is it just that the, the internet has been so overwhelming? Overwhelming to the fact that you're doing so much stuff, you sometimes start to think that half of it, did I actually see this? Do, did this really happen? 
you know, you just, it's t- continuous, continuous information over and over, day in, day out. Then trying to, as Victor calls it, the juggler. We are known for this. So we juggle, you know, we're juggling music, we're juggling family, we're juggling our health, we're juggling flights, we're juggling bills, aggravation, whatever it is. You know what I'm saying? So here, back to what I said about COVID. So COVID went like this, eh, put the brakes on, made us look at the whole picture. So back to what Karen said. So what are you going to do? Let's create a show, True House Stories. She says, I love it. But it's not house music, I said. The reason why I said house stories was because wherever you are on location, I can get you to speak through your camera and mine. Because everybody immediately assumed, oh, it's going to be another house music show. No. Because if I want Wolfgang Puck to talk, I'm calling Wolfgang Puck in LA and say, sit down in front of your computer, please, (laughs) and tell me, how did you find your first fork and knife? You know, what was that that brought that to you? What, What was the first meal or something? So through these stories and through me having the time, and the best of it was, here was the best part of COVID. Everybody was available. <laughs> Call Cox. Oh, yeah, Lenny. Hey, I'd love to do it. Great, really? Because normally try to get Call Cox. You try to even ring him. Try ringing Danny Teneglia. Try ringing, I mean, the, the, the list goes on and on. I mean, Louis Vega. Even Louis said, yeah, I'll do it. And Louis is very protective. If people know how he, how he rolls, he's very protective of how he and who he sits with. So now I'm going to go back to Morales real quick. Those that remember David, there was a minute where the papers came out and said, superstar international DJ from America arrested in Asia. So we go to True House Stories. I know David's ego. And I'm very careful with him on certain things. Know him 35 years, long time. So I know him since he's kind of like a kid. He just, God bless me, just turned 60. Happy birthday, late happy birthday, of course. And we get through all of him flexing his muscles, you know, how he explains himself. You know, he's, you know, he's very erect and, and, and all the accomplishments we talk about, dream lover, Eric was involved in. Give it up for Eric because what you hear that piano and stuff, all those parts, Eric, as we say, Eric Cooper, rocking it for you. So, David, I said to him, this is where it gets like, take a vice and go, ugh. So, David, here's the question I have to ask What happened when you were arrested? In, uh, in, J- in Japan, David stops completely. I literally seen him go, <laughs> now I said to myself, one or two things is going to happen. Either he's going to go, click, <laughs> click a clock, and say, see ya. He took a deep breath, and he says, If it was some 18-year-old kid, I wouldn't answer this. But because it's you asking me, I'm compelled to have to deal with this right now. But I'm not going to say anything. Another pause. Pregnant pause. Everybody knows that pregnant pause, everyone? My wife's pregnant. (laughs) Oh, no. Really? Uh, Great. What do I say? Congratulations? Or it's like... And then all of a sudden, he starts telling the whole story. He forgets the camera's there. He's talking to his friend now. But here's the part. Thousands of people are watching. Danny said the same thing to me in Teneglia. He's very shy. He said, man, this is super cool. I don't even feel like I'm, I feel like I'm, I'm just talking to you. It, it's, this interview's going. I said, and that's the idea. You know? Same with Victor. Vittorio Simonelli, I said, would you please come on the show? And what did he say? No. My, my pleasure. He said, of course. He said, 
And, uh, and, and he, right here to my right, has such a huge part. Here we go. <laughs> David Rosner, who used to be a friend of ours at Quad. Razzle Dazzle, as we, Roz, may he rest in peace. When Roz was hired at Shakedown under Arthur Baker, because Victor worked for Arthur Baker. Everybody remember Arthur? Okay, so Victor comes from good, good place. I mean, I mean really good. He was well-trained. He was handling those years at the end, most of Arthur's finished mixes, most of his stuff. He was being told, I need this done, this done, editing, right? You would, and you want to explain? Let me have Victor explain this part. So, this is an interesting part with Arthur Baker, yeah. your days at Shakedown. Yeah, well, I got the job there as an intern. I mean, I was right out of school. Oh, yeah, you want me to sit? Sure. Let me put the cup down. Just hold for a second. Just so you know, I, I have a job. I'll keep it short then. <laughs> yeah. You know, Thank you. Uh, yeah, just the short version. That's, I got a job for Arthur Baker when I got out of school. I went to Center for Media Arts. And I mean, he was it in the 80s. Um, everyone, I mean, he was mixing everything, but everyone here knows that. Um, so it was a dream job, and when I got there, I figured, you know, in my 17 or 18 year old mind, I was going to be in the studio that day. No, that wasn't the case. I got to the door, and he, he, came, he was coming out, and he said, who are you? And I said, I'm the new intern. They called me to come in, and this was after six months of calling them to try to get my foot in the door job, you know? And uh, he said, you come with me, you're going to help me move house. So I was a, <laughs> so I was a moving man that day. <laughs> but, and that's where I met Eric. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. It was, yes, yes, it was a meeting place. It was really the main studio in New York. Anyway, so I started as an intern there. I worked a couple of years as an intern, just running errands, cleaning up, this, that, and the other. My first session um, was uh, for Junior Vasquez. Um, yeah, it was, I, well, that was just as, as an assistant engineer. You know? But anyway, I, you know, it was, it was in a real session, so. And there were so many clients coming through there. So eventually, I got up to doing editing for him because I, I kept telling him, you know, I, I like to edit. And back then, it was editing tape. So, you know, he'd mix down the tape, and then he'd give me the tapes. He'd give me about 20 reels or whatever it was. And he'd say, Vic, I need one version from all these takes. And so I'd have to listen to all the versions and then put a version together. So he liked what I did. The first one I did was Will Downing. And then he just, he was getting all major label artists. Besides his label, Criminal, he had Criminal and Minimal. And you remember, you, go, you guys were both oh, remember yeah. that, yeah. So, um, yeah, he brought in, uh, it was Quincy Jones, Ray Charles, Shaka Khan, uh, Talking Heads, David Bowie, Blondie. I mean, just one after another kept coming through. And he just kept, gave me project after project. And, you know, I'm eight, eight, 19, whatever it was. So it was just, wow. What, and it wasn't what I was going for. I just wanted to be involved in the independent stuff. But it was definitely a great training ground, and I'm grateful to have done it. And um, you know, looking back now, I still use the skills that I learned there. So I mean, I don't. There's no up and coming people here. I, we're all about the same generation, right? But any youngsters that ask me for advice, I always tell them, um, whatever you need to do to get your foot in the door, and watching and learning, <coughs> very helpful. But I know none of us need that advice. But <laughs> We've already, you know, we've already done it. Anyway, I hope I answered your question. He forgot to mention one thing. He did a great thing. He's a professional mopper <laughs> and sweeper. Because when you started in New York, you didn't touch a tape, you didn't touch a grease pen, you touched nothing. Let me show you what you're going to be touching. You see the make of the wee wee on the floor? Clean it up. Let me add to that, what you said about juggling before. So he and I joke about it, you know, and we say if we weren't spinning and producing, we, had, we have the know-how from doing it over the years, of doing, being a janitor, a travel agent, an accountant, a lawyer. <laughs> and when you're having marital problems, call Lenny, because he's your priest too. So before I let Eric speak, because we have a time constraint, I want to talk about Claudio, Sunsquit Live which I'm a big fan of his, and I don't know if he knows that, but I'm going to let him know now. I love what he does. Like me, he's on YouTube. He does a lot of infomercial stuff, and he's got his band and everything. But I'm going to tell you, technically, this boy is a, 
This man's incredible. Grazie mille. I mean, but I'm going to let him speak in a minute. But let me say this. He pulls out choice equipment from a by era that is gone. Stuff from the late 60s. I've seen him with the Super JX keyboard. Stuff from the 70s. Stuff that's very rare. And he's giving tutorials and doing the whole thing. Is that Arthur? <laughs> This is the phone call from at the studio. Ready? Let me hear the mix. Let me hear the mix. Put the phone. After he hears the mix, Vic, more clap. I need more clap. Victor, where's Arthur right now? He's out in the Hamptons relaxing with John Robbie. Nice. Anyway, back to Claudio. So, Sun Square Live. He's been doing so much stuff. He's got his band, and he's putting up so much content and doing really great stuff, inclusive. When I hear, hear him play the music part, he gets very close to the original sounds of the band. So I like Claudio to speak, of course. I haven't had him on True House Stories. I will get him soon, but since he's here, we, we, we had to grab him. Whoa, Bo, thank you. Thank you so much. Well, number one, I want to say this. We have to pay enormous respect. I'm going to move here because this is feedback. I'm in front of the speaker. We're sound engineers. We know what we're talking about. Sorry for being in front. Yeah. All right, cool. So one big thing, we wouldn't be having this talk and this amazing time if it wasn't for one man. That's Andy Ward. Oh, yeah. And let's give it a big clap to him. And. And uh, you, 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 you oh, maybe you can stand there. Okay, cool. Okay, cool, 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 cool. We got it, we got it. And um, so, and um, so, of course, I do not have much time, unfortunately, because I have a cab going. But um, um, I, I want to try uh, first and say. Um, oh, I make a big thing out of giving as much value as I possibly can whenever I speak, whenever I make a video. And um, so, firstly, I can't even begin to tell you what honor it is for me to be standing uh, uh, amongst you guys. I'm gonna just turn my head. Um, among these amazing legends, this, this, these are the people who I look up to, right? They're only a little bit older than me, not too much. <laughs> But I have been uh, listening, studying, and in some occasion also sharing <laughs> stories with for, for, for quite a long time. So, again, give it up for, <laughs> for these three legends that we have here. Thank you so much. So I'm going to try and give you like the... Okay, I'll try to make it in three minutes about who I am and what I do. My name is Claudio. I was born in Italy and I've lived in... Uh, I've. Uh, I've started um, uh, playing piano very early. I was just obsessed with it. My brother had a Bontempi organ. He didn't use it, I would. And then subsequently I started studying uh, classical piano when I was nine. And uh, when I was 16, my piano teacher said, I know that you like computers and you double with, uh, with electronic instruments. Would you please program drums for me? I got this session at the studio. I don't know how to do it. And I said, yeah, sure. The day after I had a job in the music industry and 18 was full time so I, I and you know we're talking about tape and SM, SMTP code and that kind of stuff so um, uh, so I, I, I had the luxury of learning uh, the ropes at a very early stage when I was 20 got to the United States and got my degree in orchestra because I was really interested in, in arrangements and um, and I was lucky enough to meet up with uh, John Paritucci and Dave Weckl from the uh, Chikoria's band. Uh, they were very cool and they were very enthusiastic about this young 20-year-old Italian. They agreed to play with me and I recorded my first album at Chikoria's studio in 1993. So, and I subsequently had a record deal with Sony Italy. Went back to Italy. Not the best choice. But I went back to Italy and, uh, I mean, 
yeah, the record was released, but you know, I, I mean, it was a, it wasn't a very good record to be honest with you. I mean, listening back to it, I mean, it was interesting, it was cool, but um, but it turns out that I would have more success as a session player for pop music than as a jazz artist, and I took that, and uh, and that taught me a lot, uh, because it's you know, it's um, I I kind of developed how to listen before playing. Right, because maybe I would play this amazing jazz fast licks on pop music, and the MD would kick my ass, rightfully so, because I wasn't listening to the lyrics. You know, it's like, can you can you please listen to what this singer is playing, is saying? Can you please comp it? Thank you. Can you please play it on time? I would like you to split the click in four, please. Thank you. So that that was really important for me uh, growing up, and then you know I was making good money. And you know, I've, I've I've played with everyone in the pop music industry in Italy, from you know playing orchestra for Andrea Bocelli to uh, the, uh, m many Italian names that you will not know. So I will I will mention it. But you know, occasionally also you know um, uh, Brian Adams would come to town and his keyboard player was ill, so I would tour with him for the Italian leg of the tour and things like that. And I was producing. I did the San Remo Festival, which is a big deal in Italy. Um, as a producer, as an artist, uh, one time I even got awards and stuff. And I was making good money, but I didn't like the music, so I said, why don't we switch things around a little bit here? And uh, so I moved to London uh, because uh, that was the closest thing to America uh, without having to pretty much say goodbye to my family, right? That was two minutes, more than three minutes already. I'm almost finished. <laughs> and then I went to London and started building my own thing. I uh, built this uh, website called Dr. Mix and, um, and uh, offering mixing and mastering services. And then I was doing this project that's called Sunlight Square, which I gave a name when I didn't know how to give names. So I'm stuck with it. <laughs> Dr. Mix is a much better name, in fact. <laughs> so. Um, so with Dr. Mix uh, service, it was great. You know, I, I just had a different hat for my professional work, rather than Sunlight Square, the artistic work, which you know was working fine. You know, I, I got into the DJ world. You know, I was a snob before. I discounted DJs until I met Giles Peterson, and I said, "Wow, you can dance to jazz! Incredible!" So, and that was my door to knowing people like, like them and like you know masters at work dj spina so I, before i know they had, had embraced my music because i i started being influenced by them you know what's the bpm why that kick drum why soulful vocals why at midnight you shouldn't be playing 118 bpm you know and winehouse music you don't go faster than 127 you know that kind of stuff so i learned about it sunlight square started becoming popular to a certain extent, I had some minor hits, anyway. And then I started making some content for the Dr. Mix channel because I, I wanted to get more business. And before I knew, the Dr. Mix YouTube channel exploded. So nowadays I've got 600,000 subscribers on it, which you know for the, for the pro audio musical instrument niche is pretty significant. So, so nowadays I get money from Roland, Yamaha, and all the guys to, to make videos with their keyboards. And I wake up every morning, thank the universe, pinch myself, and keep on going. And, and, and if it wasn't for, for all of this, uh, I would have no bus business sitting in front of you today. So the, uh, the most valuable thing that I can say today for, for all of us is uh, okay. So the, greater, uh, the greatest artists that we know, from Miles Davis to, uh, to, to Jimi Hendrix to uh, Muhammad Ali to uh, artists, interesting, interesting. Uh, but they, they all are great communicators, right? So, so in a time where the attention is on this device, and I think that there is no doubt that the attention is on this device. Um, our duty as entertainer, uh, entertainers is to try and tell our story. You know, I don't know if you, if you notice, but when you post 
a SoundCloud link and say, check out my latest release, you get three likes. One is from your mom, if you're lucky to have her. But when you post a video, then you get, then you get views. Because, of course, you, know, you have to figure out that in that movement of swiping, you know, an interesting video where you show some interesting keyboard or some interesting stuff will get more attention than the millionth track that have been pushed uh, down my throat. <laughs> so, um, so content is really what changed my life. I've always made a living as a musician. I was doing all right, actually. But making videos, making you know, making content for the people to enjoy, where I tell my story, is almost more important than the music I make. If the music I make is good, good for me, win. But if you don't create content uh, for the modern medium, because don't forget, technology always wins. You, you, you can fight it, and you will be dragged kicking and screaming into the new era. You know, I remember times where people didn't want to give up the uh, Bla uh, Blackberry because the iPhone didn't have buttons. You know, that kind of stuff. I hear this story over and over again. What are we going to do with the sampler? Copyright is finished. There you go. Oh, you got off. You win. He just won. <laughs> um, you know, what are we going to do with the sampler? The, the, people are going to steal music. What are we going to do? The music business is completely goes apeshit because they don't know what to do with it. In the meantime, hip hop is born. And that's the people who embrace the technology. So, you know, you don't have to, but, you know, I see technology as a, an opportunity. We cool that? Yeah. And uh, yeah, so even if you, if you don't need great cameras, you, don't, you just need an iPhone. And even if you are nobody, you say, Hi, this is my story. I have a day job. I've always loved music and I'm trying to make it as an artist. Today I'm doing this song. What do you think? Please leave a comment. And if you have good suggestions, please leave a comment below. Do that at least once a week and your music will get more exposure than being signed to any label on the planet. Excellent, Claudio. Thank you for totally giving us the perspective from a European way of looking at it also. And good luck on your band and your future endeavors. Give it up for Claudio. He's rushing to see Quincy Jones. He's leaving. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Claudio. Ciao, grazie. Ciao, Claudio. No, me and Victor were laughing about something. We were wondering if we should stop the clock and pretend that it's one o'clock for Claudia to let him keep going because we say he, this is not enough time for him to explain it. That was a three minute conversation, went pretty good. You know, the thing that, we're gonna talk about Maurice Joshua in a second, Eric Cupper. I'm gonna, I'm gonna hand that mic over, but Quincy Jones said something interesting and all these gentlemen on this panel are gonna agree. It's not the peaks that you have to make it through. It's when it drops into the valley. <laughs> the valley can be a long stretch. And I have to say blessed to all these men right here because we're talking about not just generations, we're talking about like 75, 80 years of full experience. I, w I played Maurice Joshua, I remember in Italy and around 1991, 92, okay? Pre to that, I knew him already from coming to New York because he lived in New York, he lived in Brooklyn. And you want to talk about somebody who actually released a record on Trax Records? Right there. The original Chicago label. Come on, everybody. And a gentleman that came up through the high school circuit in Chicago because a lot of the fellas all had these Catholic school parties. Imagine that. Nuns and priests allowing debauchery with house music. And here comes the guy coming out. This is acid. This is acid. Talk about being blown away that I'm with the fella that actually sang the song, This is Acid. 
But someone forgot to mention to him, we're not on Chicago time today. Because he came here on Chicago time. You know what I'm saying? He's all right. He's all right. This one here, his history is humongous. God bless him to work with Frankie Francis Knuckles. Some of the greatest records we've all played. Forget about him having massive hits with RuPaul, okay, which is more the commercial pop side. Before RuPaul became supermodel, Eric actually wrote that. You know what I'm saying? So everybody has, well, he produced, I'm sorry. Excuse me, I, 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 to be clear, he produced it. So you talk about years of experience. If you wanted to take, pull the prism back, what you see right now is us still pushing the envelope, still wanting to make new records, still wanting to focus on being the best we can be. We also believe we can do it better than everybody else because that's part of our game. But at the same time, we all adore and love each other. But just like every race for survival, you're going to push every envelope you have. Inclusive with Maurice, for example, and I'll give you a reason why I may bring this up. When we travel around the world and we put on, you know, these happy faces, like last night everybody's asking me, how, how, how'd you enjoy it? For me, it's more about how you all enjoyed it. It doesn't make any difference if I had a great time or not. The most important thing is that all of you came and enjoyed it. Now, we see the happiness, it's a thousand smiles in my heart. But here's the part that's hard. Getting on the plane, dealing with immigration, dealing with losing luggage. He's right now, been, we've been talking about this quietly. This is a lot of times. This happens when, you know, you see us, we're tired. Uh, we could be going from gig to gig. Uh, we could have been in studio session all night and then running home quickly to shower and jump in and go to a JFK or go to London Heathrow or go to Malpensa Airport, wherever. And then have to step up on a stage and perform at our best. That's not an easy feat. Or come up with ideas. Well, I got the bills due tomorrow, whatever's happening. You got this going on. You're getting a phone call for this. This is going on. That's happening. And you're having to say, I got to shut all that off. And now I have to be the entertainer. So I'd like to welcome our late host. <laughs> da, 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 da. This is Acid. And he's also been going out for the last couple of years at Out Here Brothers singing with those fellas. So he's been back on the stage doing his little moves. Old moves, and they work, and this actually old is new, and new is hot. Okay, so I'd like to welcome Mr. Maurice Joshua. Hello, everybody. How y'all doing? I'm, uh, again, I'm sorry I'm late. I was, I was walking here and just got lost. and didn't know which way to go. Also, trying, like Lenny said, trying to find my luggage. I, I haven't got my luggage since I've been here, so... Um, is, um, it's been a, a, a venture, you know, washing my clothes, hanging them out like everybody else else, so, and then drying them up again. So, um, sorry I'm late. Um, so, I don't know the format, Lenny. You, I, they got to know what the purpose of... Oh, just a little brief history. All right. So, I, I think I'm in this industry just a little bit, right? So, all right. A couple of years. So, um, as for everybody else, I've been doing this for years. I started out as a horn player, musician. Um... Started out since sixth grade playing, um, started out playing clarinet. Then they moved me into everything. I played uh, clarinet, contrabass clarinet, but soon. Uh, and then I wind up playing tuba as my last year in high school being a tuba player. Um, and the reason why I played tuba, because it was a little guy, about four feet, three inches, playing this big thing. And I'm like, if he can play that, I know I can play that. And I'm like, you can't do it. It's a competition thing. So I, he, he wound up being first chair, I wound up being second chair, and then it just always became, became a great friendship. So that got me into um, being in music, because uh, my family was playing Earth, Wind & Fire every day. We were big Earth, Wind & Fire fans, and um, being from Chicago, they're from Chicago, so it was just like, I thought, I was like, I, I, I like the music industry, so let, let me just, just dab into it. So 
did that for years. Uh, met a best friend of mine in high school named Hula, which goes by Hot Hands Hula. Um, he produced a lot of big records for the Out Here Brothers, uh, Will Smith, Jazzy Jeff, Summertime, uh, Ruby Turner, everybody like that, Belly Ocean. So uh, we started a group back then. It was a DJ group. Um, so similar to the famous, uh, the Chicago Hot Mix 5. Um, so we wanted to start a, sub a suburb version of that. And um, we did that. And then um, as the scene progressed, house music started becoming very big. So um, we, the main thing is, as a DJ back in Chicago, you wanted to put out a record. That was like the go through, that was the end thing. If you're a DJ, you gotta put a record out. Um, back then you had to have a car with your name on the side. It was crazy stuff like that. So um, we, we put out a record on Trax Records. We found out about Trax Records through a lot of friend of ours uh, that we was working with. We knew Marsha Jefferson, Mike Dunn, Adonis, um, everybody that you've seen on label that have been complaining on Facebook about Trax Records, we, we've been a part of that. So. Um, at that time, we were very young, 17 years old, so we was like, we want to put out a record. Um, so we just started dabbling in the industry. We started buying drum machine. First drum machine, drum machine Hula brought was the uh, Roland 707. Um, then we had an SB 1200. Uh, and then we brought one keyboard. It was a Yamaha something. And the reason why I got that Yamaha keyboard, backstory of this, um, I saw David Cole one time when he was producing. He had that, that Yamaha DX7, I believe it was, something like that. And I was like, oh, they didn't make it no more, so I was just trying to find it. And back then, it wasn't like you can go online and find anything, so you just had to go in and talk to people and see if they had all the old equipment. So I brought an old Yamaha keyboard, and that's what we had to work with all the time. So um, once we got in that, we did an EP with uh, Trax Record. Uh, it was myself and Hula. We did. It was a e. It was an EP. So at first it was supposed to be a single deal. So at the time, <laughs> in Chicago, it was one guy named Liddell Townsell. He used to do all the records for Larry Sherman. That if Larry didn't know who made the record, he made Liddell go make the record over again so he can put it out. <laughs> so it was crazy like that. So we got word of this and. Um, a local DJ back in Chicago, Farley Jack Master Funk, they called him back first, and Farley Funk and Keith. He was huge on radio, and he was part started a Hard Mix 5. So he went around Chicago claiming that he did a record of mine. So it was the first record I did. Uh, Be Respect was called I Got a Big Member, and we put it out on track. So it was very, very, right, very underground record. So Farley was going around saying, oh, I did the record, blah, blah, blah. So nobody knew who did it because we was just from outskirts of Chicago. So people really know what was going on. So I got a word of that. Um, Liddell was about to do the record over again for track for Larry Sherman. So me and Hula was that we was having a parties out and we was like, we had a friend of ours invite Liddell to the party at that time. Now at that time we were very young, immature, and we was gonna beat his ass because he, he was gonna take our record. So we was gonna hit him up in the back room and beat his ass, right? Because I'm like, how you gonna steal our record? But um, Liddell came to us just up front. Yeah, Larry told me to do it. He's like, I can take you to Larry tomorrow so you guys can talk to him if you guys did the record and you can just go ahead and do it. So that's where the history was made. Liddell brought us to Larry. We talked to Larry. Still immature and young, we didn't know about the industry. We was like, yes, let's put it out. We did the, he wanted the, I got a big member record, but I was like, I'm gonna do two or three more records. So I did another record called Feel the Mood, and then the B side was the record I did with Hula called This Is Acid. So uh, we came into the studio. Thank you, thank you very much. Wrote the record, did everything down there, and put the record out. It did, it's, oh, it did okay, we didn't know what was going on. A year later, we get a call that a gentleman of Les Adams out of the UK remixed the record. So at that time, uh, Todd Terry, Black Riot, all that stuff was huge. So Les took the sample, just like Todd did, rearranged it, and made the record This Is Acid. So we get a call from Larry Sherman, and he was like, um, this record is blowing up big. And um, we was like, what record is it? So they said, This Is Acid. And we are like, huh, that's the B-side. And we haven't heard the record. So once he sent it to us, it was a record, but it had no, the TR, and it had no acid in there. And we was like, why is it called, and why the remix have nothing like that in there? So 
my partner at the time, Hula, didn't like the record at all. Just didn't want to have anything to do with it, nothing at all. Um, got my first call from New York. Uh, it, was a, it was a club back in the day called the Post Office. And they was like, in Brooklyn, that's right. And they was like, um, we want you to perform and do a show. And at the time, I'm like, what's the show? Uh, what? <laughs> so at that time, um, I was managing in a teen club back then and spinning and still doing music. So we put the group together. And we didn't know what to do. We didn't know what to expect. Um, we did the record, uh, went out there, did the show. Um, Hula at the point still was neglecting. He's like, I don't want to. Hula did the lead vocals to this is asset. We, we wrote it. He did the lead vocals. So at the time, he was like, I don't want nothing a part of this because it's, it's not the original content of that did. So we was debating going back and forth. So we did the show at the post office. First show, it was like very, it was, you know, we tried to put a routine together. Uh, it went over well. After that show, record went crazy. Just blew up. Um, Vendetta and them picked up the record. Uh, same label as uh, David Cole, uh, a ton of, yeah, Cavillas, yeah, Robert Cavillas, everybody. Larry Asgard was my guy, Bruce Carbone, uh, Martha Reynolds. Um, we had a great relationship. The record blew up. They took us everywhere. That record took me around the world and to get everybody who I know who are a &Rs now, president of record labels, uh, because they was going up the ranking. And um, that was 1989. And uh, 1988, 89, yeah. Yeah, right, in the 1900s. That was in the 1900s, right. Um, so after I did that tour, we toured for a whole year straight, um, mainly in the States, nothing overseas. We didn't have, with that record, with this is and really no, didn't go well overseas. But in the States, it took us everywhere. Uh, we did every nightclub in New York. That's why when Lenny said I lived in New York and Brooklyn for a year. Um, took us everywhere. Palace, Palladium, The Tunnel, uh, Red Zone, uh, you just name it. Every club that was hot back under, with, with Junior Vasquez, you, that's right. Sound that's right, Sound Factory. So then that's when I started meeting all the New York guys and started becoming and having a relation with them and wanting to uh, be with them. You know, Johnny D, Lenny, everybody, masters of work. Um, once that record got over and we started doing the second set, I was like, I, this is what I want to do. I don't want to be in the forefront like an artist or anything, but I want to create the music and, and just have a just a, a impact on the scene because house music was getting big. Um, I mean, everybody at the time was trying to do it. Um, and then my label mate at the time, uh, David and Robert, that created CNC Music Factory, um, it was crazy. I was over his house, David's house. We went over his house, and we was late. We always say we was going to do a record together because knowing David and Robert, they always sample and took bites and bits from everybody and read their records. And we was just like, yo, we got to get together. So we was label mates, always try to get do something together, but it just, just, just everybody just blew up at the same time almost. So because it was uh, two Puerto Ricans and a black man, and David it was, Robert. yeah, they were So it was just crazy because it was like, we all came up at the same time when it, and it was a great feeling because you saw the evolution of house music being born at that time and then all the majors want to be in a part of it, which was great. But then after that came the DJ part of it. Like we started a DJ. So we, you know, we just, I mean, we can talk days for that, but it's just the UK was very friendly to us. They, they picked up on the music scene, which we love and we always honor that because we like, and that's the place where we always wanted to go because you guys always appreciated that music more than anybody else. And it was just like, unbelievable. And it was just like, you go to different countries, can't even speak the, the language, but they would know your song and your record that you play, which was a great feeling that to this day that gets me going no matter what. Like Lenny said, no matter if you're traveling and you're tired, whatever, you come in here performing to do a show for everybody to make sure everybody's happy and everybody's feel good. So the other night when that happened, you, there's no money, there's nothing else can give you that feeling that just having everybody together and having a great time. So just long story short, after that, I started doing my own label at the time. So I, I did um, uh, Vibe Records, thank you very much. Uh, I did uh, Music Plant. I did uh, a label I had with Strictly, uh, distributed by Strictly Rhythm called Ruckus Records at one time. 
Um, and then when we did the Vibe Records, we had a deal with MCA uh, out of the UK. So we had our artists on there, Michi, Deborah, Georgie, uh, Terry Hunter. Uh, I used to manage Terry Hunter and Aaron Smith. People didn't know that too, because was, they was part of our label. So they was part of the UBQ at the time. And then they grew up, and Terry just blowing up right now, doing everything underneath the, the, the wind right now. So, um, and then just started travel, you know, working with a lot of guys like this. Um, always want to do a record with Eric. We, we're going to do it. Did work with Lenny sometime. Do we do one right here with Victor? So that's right. And, and during the pandemic, this, this is the great thing that I use Lenny and be like, because, you know, I, I did a record that you guys just heard just recently with Barbara Cuckler called The B Crew, and it's with Don Toman and some other people. And um, I used Lenny Studio, and Lenny uh, was much obliged as helping me out on there because I, I used the bassist Gene Perez that plays for Masters of Work a lot. Um, and so Gene couldn't do it in this place, so he's like, where can we do it? I'm like, ah, Lenny. So I made the phone call to Lenny, and we made it happen. And I appreciate that very much. Thank you so much. And it turned out great. Um, and that was the only one. We did um, Ten City, right? I just did a record for Ten City News album. Um, I just, uh, I, the one on the, not the one that recently, but the newest one that's about to come out right now. We just finished that record. Uh, it's not an ultra. It's coming out on um, the new label uh, with Patrick Moxie. Uh, yeah, higher, yeah. So that, yeah, so that's it's coming out pretty soon. Uh, I got one more record to finish with them, and then um, I think it'll be done after that. But um, yeah, but just coming together, I did all that. Uh, started after that, started doing all the remixes for all the major labels, urban acts. So it was a niche there because nobody was really doing the urban masters work. Did some, but then nobody wasn't really trying to commercialize on it. So. Uh, my big break came with Sony Music, and I did something with Dave German. He was, uh, at that time, they had a dance department at, at the major label, the records label at the time. So um, he could, yeah, he, right, remember that? He connected me with a group, and he said, Maurice, this group is going to be huge. Please work with us with this, blah, 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 all this stuff. So the group was called Destiny's Child. Yeah. At the time, the name sounds very familiar. At that time, it was like, who the hell and what is a Destiny Child? <laughs> so um, I got to meet with them, uh, with their father, Matthew Knowles, and it became a relationship because when we first did the record, Bills, 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 I was like, you know what? I want to do something like a live band with them. And thank you very much, sir. All right, all right. Uh, I wanted to do something live, so I did a whole live band with the Bills, Bills, Bills and did another mix at the same time. But they really enjoyed that because it was something different. And what I did was I had the girls come into Chicago and re-recut the vocals. So every record on a Destiny Child record that I did is recut vocals. They're totally different vocals from there. If you listen to the original, to, the, to, to my version, every record was all new cut re-vocals, -re except for when they started going solo. But any Destiny Child record was all recut vocals, different background arrangements and everything. So um, at that time, I say about the third single, um, they wanted to sign, uh, Matthew No signed me as a management for a year, so I was under his management. And then we just started working incredibly. They was like, listen, you're gonna be the exclusive remixer for us for a while. So, and I was like, yes, let's go ahead and do that. And um, you know, we got that and then, it just carried over to every other the the lady's solo career. So it was Beyonce, Michelle, Kelly. So then when I started working with Beyonce, the single that got me a Grammy was the Crazy in Love featuring Jay-Z, and that was the record that won for the Grammy that year. So that was my story. And I'm I'm continuing making records and I'm continuing working with everybody and just love just love giving back and just love seeing and feeling, especially now that we haven't been traveling that much. This week proved to me that there's people out there still love our music, still love what we do, and that gets me the passion to keep on going because at some point you sit back, you be like, what's my purpose? Is this really, really working? Especially during the pandemic because everything shut down, so other people had to do different things in order to survive because, like I said, this was the li livelihood, DJing, producing, making music for everybody. But when the world shuts down for two years, you can't make music, only people listen to music while they just listening at home, you'd be like, what I'm really doing, because it's, it's not going nowhere. 
but then that's become like Claudia said, you have to do different, you got to think about streaming, what you, content. So we know content is king now, so that's what you got to have now. So thank God Lenny has the True House Stories, which is great. Give it up for True House Stories, y'all. I mean, he's telling his story, which he has great people on there. Please go check out that. If you haven't seen it, please go look at it. It's great work. And I just think that any content that you have regarding what you want to do and what is your purpose and what you love doing, someone will find that no matter. It, it, it may start out real slow. You may be like, oh, I got three likes. It's okay. I don't care if you got one like. Put it out. Do it. Don't wait on it. If you think about doing it, whatever you want to do, just do it. Even if you want to DJ, whatever, do it. Just stream it. Just put it online and just have it out there so people can see. People will come see you. That's one thing about that. If they searching for it, they will come across something, and you will never know because the songs that I did or I played somewhere, people like I came across this long time ago, and I'm just hearing it now, and it's crazy. Like Lenny said, everything old is new now. So. You can still do it, and everybody still had time. So this one thing about this industry is that, and it's no limit. It's, it's ageless to DJ, and it's ageless to write and hit records, too. So you don't have to sit here and be like, oh, in my 20s, I could have wrote. No, you can write a record until, until you stop breathing, yep. just long as it's great. So just keep on doing what you guys got to do. I love you guys. Thank you so much. And again, I apologize for being late. We'll forgive you. Sorry, Eric. God, my man, Maurice Joshua, Chicago legend in the house there. When I say legendary, we're going to talk about Eric Cupper now. So I want to take it back to the 70s for a moment. The art of the remix begins with a man named Tom Moulton. God bless him, just turned 81 years old and still mixing records. Okay. Victor's very tight with him, like a son. Helps him out as much as he can, but I'm going to say this. Tom still has the excitement and the dream. So, the 80s come. House music begins. The business of dance music becomes part of what New York's landscape is about. Chicago and New York seem to rule the roost. Hacienda starts with Graham Park to play some of these records that are starting to cross the shores, Okay. The remix part of it starts to become an official thing. Now, in the 80s in New York, you had Shep Pettibone, T. Scott, Arthur Baker. I mean, they were touching everything. Frankie. Well, Frankie was as well. I'm going to talk about that as well because we're going to bring that to you in a minute. Frankie's touching, re-editing, and creating mixes in Chicago for his club with the thinking that music is... Because I remember Frankie telling us music was changing... And I need to put music that I feel is appropriate for my crowd. And that's what was happening with the DJs. New York Radio, Timmy Regisford on WBLS, Tony Humphreys on 98.7 KISS, who's championing the records, who helped a lot of us in our careers. And why do I say that? Tony would hear a record and start to beat it every week. Friday, Saturday night, three nights at the club at Zanzibar, and next thing you know, six months later, not even, two months later, hello, are you Eric Copper? Yes. I'm such and such from A&M Records, and I like to license your record, and da-da-da, and that came from across the ocean, okay? But pre to, pre to that, as... Maurice mentioned, Dave German. I want to also mention another person that's very important, Judy Weinstein, who was the manager of Def Mix. Okay? Some agree with me on this, some don't agree with me. She helped create this thing called Reproduction and Remix Wordy. Hello, everyone. We never had that before. So what was happening was you used to say, Mix by T. Scott. Mix by da-da-da. Not reproduction. Why do I say reproduction? Here we go. Back in the late 80s into the 90s, we were getting the songs. The music was cool, a little too commercial. It was no such thing as, oh, we want you to use the stems. We want you just to do what you do in the studio, and we want your magic. So what does that mean? You'd have to kind of take the vocal and start to reproduce. 
So this is where the magic comes. This talented brother would now hear a vocal with drums. So David would say to whoever he's working with at the time, Morales or Frankie, we're going to have the drums sync up the new vocal. Eric comes in. Piano's there. He hears the key and changes the groove, changes the melody, puts these super cool chords under it. Dun, 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 And there we go. And that's the beginning of the real remix business starts. And he's one of the guys in New York, right behind the powerhouse of Def Mix, right here. One of the most talented keyboard players. Needless to say, one of the most successful Billboard dance remixers of all time. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? More remixes on Billboard are Eric Cupper. It's incredible. I don't even know the number. How much is it now? How many? Excuse me. Let's say this really slow. 122 number one Billboard dance remixes by Mr. Eric Kappa. Either, either, played on, either played on or remixed myself. Probably about half and a half between working with other people in my own. But he's going to have to tell you how he finds dance music, people. Because this is the interesting story. You know, rock and roll guy, new wave guy is going to take you into the dance world. This is why I say welcome to True House Stories. I think it's Steve So Curly. You think so? It's got to be. No, I, I, I think Steve probably did it a little after, but I think it was David, definitely David and Frankie first. Thank you. Well, that's okay. And then it was Steve, I believe, because before... The okay, I'll tell you which one. I know which one. I'll give you a quick story. He just reminded me. Lee John. Everybody know Lee John? Yeah. Okay. okay. RCA Records. Arthur Baker produces the record. Imagination, right? It's imagination. The record's called Instinctual. David Morales is brought in to do a remix. And the keyboard player, if I remember correctly, was Josh Milan or Kevin Hedge was involved from Blaze. Everybody remember Blaze, the group? So Arthur gives the parts, I guess, or whatever. RCA gives the commission to Morales. David goes in. He puts the vocal up. They play the bass line out of key. Lee John has a canary. I don't like it. It's horrible. He doesn't want to hear nothing. I don't like this. This is it. Are you? Because I, 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 I know Lee. He told me. I hated it. I hated what he did. Well, New York City loved it. Ron Ricardo was playing it at, at Roxy at 1018 at that time. That record blew up. That was the first official, like I would say, David Morales remix where we heard a complete different music. So this is why I come to this man at the end because the remix game was so important to the careers of a lot of the pop stars that crossed into dance music, correct? And actually did better and had a longer career than sitting in the pop world. You know? Imagine getting the Mariah Carey vocals and having a go where he's putting parts together, the piano parts, and it's so damn good that now Tommy Mottola, CEO of Sony Records, says, we're going to bring in Mariah to recut the vocal. First time that ever happened. And that was, I'd like to congratulate, and let's bring to the microphone, Mr. Eric Kappa. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, in 1975, <laughs> I somehow convinced my father to let me take half of the $1,000 I got for my bar mitzvah to buy a synthesizer. I was so, at the time, anything with an electronic sound just blew my mind. I remember when I was a little kid and I heard good vibrations by the Beach Boys and I, that, woo, 
woo sound. I was like, what the hell is that? And it just always, anything that wasn't a normal traditional instrument or just anything that was, when I heard like Hendrix using flangers all over every, any thing with electronic process sound was just like blowing me, my mind. So from there, I started messing around just playing with cassettes, recording things with, like I had this little drum machine like. Just a cassette. No. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> I had one of these drum machines that were meant to play like with an organ that had like bossa nova and foxtrot and things like that. And I just used to make these weird cassettes. I had a boombox and a cassette machine. And I would record on a cassette machine, put that in the boombox, record that back onto the cassette machine while playing another part. So I was doing these like multi-track recordings as a 14-year-old kid messing around. You know, I, I had no, there was no YouTube to teach me how to do this. I just figured out wow, you could do this. I have a boombox, and I have one of these, and I could play at the same time, and whatever. And then I got in a band playing covers, and I learned 90% of what I did from Greg Allman, from the Allman Brothers, listening to his, like, these soulful, bluesy organ stuff, and from Santana. And if you listen, there's a song I did, Latin Blues, back in the 90s. It's a, like an organ-based record. It's all Greg Allman and Santana, basically. Um, and from there, I got involved in a band that was kind of like, there was a scene in New York called No Wave, and it was like punk funk almost. It was just like, it was New Wave and punk was like, again, you know, kind of a, a backlash to commercial music. No Wave was a backlash to punk and New Wave almost. And we were kind of doing our own thing, and eventually that band morphed into a blue-eyed soul band. Almost like, I always say, like Paul Weller from The Jam ended up in style, doing Style Council. And we had a singer, we had a, um, we went through kind of singers and drummers, like people changed their underwear, but it was a core of three guys with different singers, and we had a development deal with RCA through a friend of mine, um, a friend of mine was date, well, through many, a few different connections. Um, there was a guy named Justin Strauss in New York. He was the DJ at the coolest clubs in New York. He, he was the Ritz, the Mud Club area. And he also had had a band, like a uh, kind of power pop band earlier on, on Stiff Records. Um, and he took interest in my band, and he wanted to produce us. Him and his partner at the time, Murray Elias, who was known actually mostly for reggae music. He was the guy who signed Sean Paul and Cuddy Ranks and all these guys. And um, yet from, from there, the band kind of fell through. We got this development deal with RCA, but we, whatever it is, just fizzled out. But Justin, and Murray was starting to do a remix or two. They did like a couple of remixes before they brought me in. They go, hey, we want you to play guitar on this record. I'm like, sure. So I come in, play guitar on it, and they go, well, we also want a bass line. I go, okay, there was a, a DX7 in the room. Right, 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 right. So I, we played it. I, we weren't sequencing back then. I didn't know how to sequence. I knew how to work a synthesizer, but MIDI was kind of a new thing. This is 1986. And we did this record, which was, I would call it a dance record, not a house record, but it was, you know, like a dance pop record. And then they brought me in to do this other record. It was by an artist called Bill Nelson, who is from Bebop Deluxe, if anyone, from, uh, and we were hired to do a house mix of it. And we did. And from there, I think maybe the third or fourth record we did was Debbie Harry from Blondie, did this record called In Love With Love. And we did a, a freestyle mix to it, kind of like Cover Girls, Show Me. That was kind of the vibe we were doing. And that was my first number one Billboard record. It went, yeah, it went, number, went number one Billboard. But from there, like Justin introduced, I mean, I knew some house records. I had a bunch of 12 inches at home, and I was a record collector and just a music head overall. But he kind of... You know, I never heard Marshall Jefferson until Justin played it for me. 
um, back in 86. And, you know, Claudio mentioned something very interesting. He was like, oh, the, you know, the house music, you know, whatever. Uh, it's until Giles Peter. Most keyboardists in New York who were like kind of keyboardists for hire thought like, oh, this is this, what a simple crap. It's beneath me, you know, and whatever. Yeah. And I, I was like, no, this is dope. This is great. <laughs> this, is, this is the new, this is, this is it. And I actually became known as the guy who actually liked his job, <laughs> you know, like as to, to be hired as a keyboard player. So from there, I started, um, you know, Justin was the man who, who got me started. And then I got um, a call from a guy named Richie Jones, I think he was second, who we ended up doing this album by called Degrees of Motion. And uh, Shine On and Do You Want It Right Now became the classics in the UK more than the, in the States. But, um, and then I get this call from this, okay, one, one day with uh, Justin, there was a guy, um, we did this track at Supertronics, remember that? It was this little studio in, in Brooklyn. It was a little shady what was going on there, but I don't know what, you know. Um, yeah, yeah, I don't know. If there might have been drugs involved at this place. Who knows? But, uh, <laughs> um, the, this record, I think it was a Janice Christie record we were working on. And our editor, Chep Nunez, he, who passed away, sadly, um, he was still around, but he, I think he was too busy or he was out of town, he couldn't do the record. So uh, Justin, you know, being, knowing all the DJs in New York, he uh, said, he said, I'm gonna, I'm gonna call this guy David Morales to edit it. And David did the edit on that record. And the funny thing about it, David didn't realize that he wasn't, that he got the master. Because very, what you did with tapes, you took the master, you made a copy and you edited that. He chopped it up into pieces. He actually chopped up the master. <laughs> no, on the, one, on the half inch. Yeah, on the half inch. He chopped up the half inch. But it all worked out in the end. But, um, but after that, in 1989, I remember I get a call from David Morales, who already now had a few remixes out. And I remember he was like, yeah, man, I'll, I'll give you a shot. I was like, cool. <laughs> and we went into Shakedown where everyone met, yeah, which was where I met Victor. I did a record with Victor and Lenny D back in the days when they were the original Brooklyn Funk Essentials was them. Um, and we solidified a relationship. We, and a week later, I'm in the studio working with David and Frankie on a record. Uh, it was a record by a British um, R&B act called Reed, R-E-I-D. And, it, and the funny thing is, I also did the same record with Richie Jones. It happened a few times wow. where I was called by two different producers to do the same record. Yeah. But that solidified my relationship with, uh, with David and then Frankie. And then Frankie called me in to do a few mixes. And we did, at that time, we did Alice in Limerick, Where Love Lives. We did, finally, C.C. Penniston. Um, David did a bunch of stuff with the Chan. I mean, it was that seminal period in vocal house history. Yeah. It was just an amazing period. And, um, you know, I feel very fortunate to, to just stumbled upon in this opportunity. And uh, then one day, Frankie um, said, I got an album deal with The Virgin. And I want to come over. I, I set up a little home studio at that point. And I uh, just got my first Mac. It was 1990. I paid $800 for a 40 megabyte hard drive. <laughs> megabyte. Right, megabyte. Megabyte. Gig. Yeah, we're talking like 40 floppy disks, right. basically. Um, and he said, there's this, you know, this track I want to work on. And uh, it was this track was called Workout. And, okay, back it up just a, a few uh, weeks before that. There was a um, Def Mix fifth anniversary party at the Red Zone. Third or fifth, I, don't, I think it was fifth, maybe fifth, 1989 or 1990. And I heard Frankie play for the first time. And I was so moved by what he was playing, I went home and did this little track and I recorded it onto a cassette. And literally, I mean, was it 909, I went, 
you know, you can do bang, bang. You know, when, you, when you're working on a drum machine, the brilliant thing about it, you don't sit there and think about it too much. You just go bang, 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 boop, boop. Oh, that sounds cool. You, you hit the wrong thing, you go, oh, that's better than what I would have actually thought of doing. And so I banged out this little beat, did a bass line, did a pad. Um, then I said, you know what? I'm gonna do I, Bobby Condor's The Poem had this really cool flute solo on it. So I took the rack version of the DX7, which had this really nasty flute sound. It was terrible. I bathed it in so much reverb, you couldn't tell that it sounded so bad. And I did this flute solo. And then I did this little hook line and this one other line. So I think there's five keyboards and five tracks of drums in total. That was the whistle song. And when Frankie came in to do workout, I slipped in his cassette. I was like, hey, this is a track I did, you know, based on you know, what I heard you playing the other night. And he was like, he heard it. He goes, this is really cool. He goes, let me have it and maybe, you know, put a vocal on it and we'll make it to the album. I'm like, cool. Well, Frankie takes the cassette. He transfers it to reel to reel. He starts playing it at the sound factory and people are running up to the DJ booth saying, what is this whistle song you've been playing? So the track was actually named by the crowd at the sound factory. Um, yeah. And then he, um, he said, you know what? This doesn't need a vocal, <laughs> but I'm gonna do a version. He goes, we're gonna put your version out on the 12 inch. My version's gonna be on the album. And he had Paul Shapiro come and do some live flute. And he, you know, he changed up, he, he kept my drums, but he, I think he, he, I don't know if he muted the clap or he made it really low in the ride, really low. It just had a different feel to it. It was a little punchier. Mine was a little lighter and swingier. And it worked great. It got, it, it got us on top of the pops. We were on top of the pops with Cher and the Shaman, I remember. <laughs> I remember the guy from the Shaman. Sorry? Question, do you still get the cassette? What, no, I, yeah, I probably do actually in a box somewhere I might. Yeah. Right, I'm going to hit a cassette version. Well, I actually took that cassette version and I had to recreate it uh, onto a DAT. Okay. And that's what ended up being the EK 12 inch. And, yeah. Oh, wow. I literally didn't have to do the same moves. I, every, the drums were all done on a keyboard mixer, this right. little Toa thing. And when the kick dropped out, I was going whoop, whoop, and bring it back up. Yeah. I mean, everything else was done on the computer, so I, that was arranged. But the drums I had to do all live and everything like that. Um, where, where, yeah, I remember uh, at, at the, shame, the guy from The Shaman, he was backstage carrying an ARP 2600, which is this big analog synthesizer, this big. Right. And he, I remember he said to me, he goes, if you ever need any wicked analog, give me a call. <laughs> he was like this synthesizer troll. It was, like, <laughs> it was hysterical. But uh, anyway, from there, at, at that, the whistle song was a big breaking point for me. Suddenly, I get a call from Guy Moot who was at the time, um, no, he was EMI pub Music yeah, Publishing, yeah, yeah. and he offered me a publishing deal, even though I had already signed up. He was the, he was the first disappointed because I had signed the publishing for the whistle song to Def Mix oh, wow. for $2,000. Yeah, I, it all worked out in the end, and I got it back, and it's mine again, and I, I got, but, you know, yeah, it, be, you know, it became a Nesty commercial. I got paid from that, but... Um, he signed me to a deal. Um, he was the guy at EMI who was signing more dance oriented artists. He, I remember him playing a cassette of this new acid jazz artist, and his name was Jamariquai. In the, you know, it was, it was he was really on the he had his finger on the pulse. And um, from there, my career just started taking shape. And I still was doing a lot of keyboards from other people, but I was getting calls to produce and do tracks, and I get a call. I, I was working with a guy named Larry T. Remember Larry? Larry T was a DJ in New York who did these crazy parties. These just, what, what were they called, the name of that party, man? The, at, it was at the Underground. But anyway, he, he did this, he's just wild. People dressed up like, you know, just really fun, like off the hook parties. And he brought me in to work on a couple of tracks that he did. And I remember bringing me to a track, I think it was on Vendetta, this a tr track um, with RuPaul, the singer, this, this, tr this drag queen who I never saw in drag for about two years before I knew him. I mean, after I knew him. But he brought me in to work on this track. And from there, 
I get a call. He just got to deal with Tommy Boy. And, to, and they called me to, uh, you know, try producing this track. And this track was called Supermodel. So I produced it. And then they go, you know what? We've got a couple more for you. Cool. And they go, you know what? Just do the whole album. And we, I ended up writing half the album. And that was another big turning point. Suddenly I was Huge. producing stuff, you know, like, and pop artists were starting to come my way and stuff like that. So it was, it was very cool, man. It was, it was very organic, just... And the thing is, when you, if you see the crack in the door like that, you j you jam your foot in. You might get bruised, right. but you gotta you gotta recognize the opportunity. Eric, a question. Yeah, man. Um, you seem to have a, a very distinctive sound. Um, I think everyone in this room knows you can hear an Eric Clapton track straight away. <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah, well, very good question. And this is why, if you listen to, especially the stuff I put out on my own label, it strays from what everyone considers. Like, I know when people, some people when they hire me, they want my, a distinctive sound. They want the, that rhythmic, be it a piano or a Rhodes, bum, 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 you know, like, and very much like what we did with Director's Cut, we're talking about Frankie. Um, and that big, lush kind of sound. But I make sure I do other stuff. Like, I, do, I was doing techno records on RNS with um, Lenny D. Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, I've always, if, you, if you check out my discography carefully, you'll hear some weird shit. <laughs> I produced a, a hip-hop um, horn, all New Orleans brass. Band. It was literally nothing. I was calling it drum and brass. Because and it, the tuba's doing the bass line. I took a tuba and mic'd it up and put it put a DBX 120 underneath it, wow. yeah, to, to give it this sub. And we made an album for Hollywood Records. It's dope. I'll I'll send you a track. I mean, I was you know I've always been. I pride myself in doing all kinds of music. I've produced a, a British all-girl rock band, like heavy metal band um, from Brighton. I. You know, music in general just turns, and doing other kinds of music other than house music always makes me do better house music for whatever reason. But yeah, there is the Eric Cupper signature sound, and sometimes I'm very happy when they go, you know what, we just want you to do whatever you want to do. And that's when I'll often stray from it. But there is something, it's, I notice people say, you know, I have a certain polish to my production, and that's the guys who turn me on to production. George Martin, I don't know if you've ever heard of him. He produced this little band called The Beatles. Um, Quincy, you know, Quincy Jones, uh, Trevor Horn, um, Stevie Wonder. I mean, those three albums, Talking Book, um, Fulfilling His First, and the, 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 um, the one with Superstition, the, the um, Inner Visions. Those three albums, the production is so impeccable and so perfect. and has a vibe but it's also smooth you know and that's I always I didn't I didn't like too polish I wasn't like into Toto and stuff like that even though a lot of you know the, the production's great yeah <laughs> it, to me that was too slick for me I always wanted a little bit of grit Brian Eno when he did all talking heads and stuff like that it was just amazing it had polish it had an ambience and again Trevor Horn slave to the fucking rhythm that album oh my god when I first heard it it's one song. The whole thing is one song. And it's just like, it was almost, if you think about it, talking about a remix, it's all, it's just this one long remix of one song, just different versions of it. But um, yeah, we were talking about, Justin was among the first to, what we would do back in those days, we had to do a version for them, and then we did a version for us. So we did a version that followed their song, sometimes used some of their instruments, but then we did the fucked up version, <laughs> where we stripped it down just to vocal, and that's the version that the D most of the DJs played, and that was the um, part of the evolution of being able to get away with not having to do the version for them anymore. We just started doing the version for us. So, um, 36 years later, here I am. It bugs me out, and I was telling these guys, even in general, it bugs me out that. 
he was this, you know, I started making house music in 86, what it arguably was 84 maybe, when it kind of started and was kind of bouncing back and forth between Chicago and New York. You know, Chicago and say, we started in New York, people say, well, you, but Frankie was in Sh New York, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, making this kind of music and then moved to Chicago and, but, but. I have to give it to Timmy Reggie and Boy Charles. Yeah. Because I'm trained with records, music got me, we drum machine, and we boy playing the bass. And, and that's, yeah, yeah. that's a, that's, and that's, that's, a that's, big, that's, that's a big controversy you're saying, controversy. because yeah, we were saying, why can't the visual music got me be considered as the first house record? Because it is drum machine, it is synthesizer. Yeah. But I think at the time, they were, that was still. Okay. That's going to cost you, Andy. No. <laughs> um, we, we, we were saying about visual music got me. It was a New York record. But we were saying that it had synthesizer and the, and the bass, and, and it, it, it all fits the stereotypical of, of a house record. Yeah. But I think at the time, it was still considered R, like black R&B, R&B dance that they were saying back in the day. So I think that's where the issue was. Because it was on. I wanted you to add something else to this, because a lot of people that grew up in Europe and the UK, they don't realize how much influence so many European were, records were uh, uh, were in Chicago. And you, oh, most definitely, exactly. And if you could talk about that a little bit, just from a Chicago point of view. So I, I think I think what happened with us with we're back in the day, like during the late '80s, we was getting all these imports coming in. So, basically, what what as a Chicago house producer, this is what we did. We want to do what Eric was saying: strip it down barely, because some of the records you get it, it, it's too polished, it, 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 too many strings, too many breakdown. So we just wanted that raw, gritty bass line and probably a synth, and then the drums gonna move it completely. So that's what we did for like creating that house sound, like. We recreate the bass line. So a lot of the records that Victor was telling him, we'll do some stuff and just take the bass line out and rock it like that. And people be like, yeah, like, oh. like, like uh, Steve Silk Hurley, he said yes. that music is, is the key. Yes. Yeah, Steve Silk Hurley, he personally told me. He said, music is the key by J.M. Silk right. was the bass line to I want it, be re I want it to be real by John Rocca. Yeah. And he just flipped the bass line. Right? And that's, and, and, and that's what we usually do as, as you hear it as a DJ producer. You can't steal the whole thing, or I'm sorry, you can't take the whole thing. You have to recreate the whole thing and do something different. But I wanted to add something to that, Eric, from, from the whole Def Mix production. When I was coming up, because I guess started this with my brother, Xavier Josh, who was DJing. Um, he made me, because he knew Frankie. He, he knew Frankie back in the, in the late 70s and was going to the warehouse. And I lived vicariously through him because I, I'll see him coming home and he'll be coming home like when I'm getting up, I'm like, where you been? Right. He like, man, we was at this party with Frankie and Uncle, and he'll, he'll bring home reel to reels and play the music like this is what he was playing. So that's what got me into DJing. But it was Frankie and David because as a DJ, I was listening to all the music and all the production. And I'm like, I want to do that. Because when I was doing This Is Ass and traveling in New York, I wasn't putting out that many records at the time. I was just touring. But then going to the tunnel, going to the red zone, and hearing David, and, and that was his club. And when I say going to the red, it brings back so many memories because a lot of records broke there, at there in the tunnel that made you think like, wow, that's history. And that sound, after we got off tour, I was like, I want to do something like that too because when I heard the re the one record that I heard in the red zone that still to this day was the uh, What You Gonna Do For My Lovin' yeah. that David and Frankie did. And that I record... Yes, and that record right there got me was like, oh my goodness. That's when I fell in love like on the remix tip. Uh -huh. and, and that was playing, peak at night, playing it. Drop it, not, it's not like a beginning record, whatever. Back then you can play it, it was the form, the way you format the crowd, you had the crowd. I remember we was at the tunnel and they was playing uh, Keep On, uh, um, Soul to Soul, Keep On Moving. Yeah, yeah. Played the record, everybody on the dance floor just stumping to the beat, and, and he broke the record out and just took and just, it was amazing. But I just wanted to say that you guys was a big influence on, on myself because y'all had me do what I wanted to do. Damn. There's one funny little story about that record was during the session, I was I'm a goofy guy, and during the session I was just goofing around. Um, you know, I did this big string pad. Through the whole thing, 
and through that same sound, which is a Proteus string, I just goofed around and just as a, literally as a joke, I did the move your body thing. And Frankie and David went, <laughs> put that in. I'm like, you gotta be kidding me. <laughs> put it in. And then we took the bass line and made a separate bass track that didn't follow the chord tracks. It just sit, sat on the one note and that became the break and the end yeah, for that record. That sounds great on that record. I mean, she, she, <laughs> oh, that she, was one of her best sounding records. Absolutely. Right there. Yeah, that's you know, really Yeah, but one, a couple of names I wanted to mention that, you know, because we were talking about Prelude. Francois K., yeah. who I've worked with extensively, he's a close friend. This guy, talk about influencing everything we did. I mean, his work with like D Train, you're the one for me. He mixed that record. To me, that record is a a cross of a house record in a way too. I mean, you could put that on in the middle of a house set Absolutely. and no one's gonna say Jack, they're just gonna dance. Yeah. Um, that whole prelude thing and what Francois was doing back then was, was unbelievable. Um, and yeah, I, I, I was saying 36 years ago when house music was in its formative stages, if anyone told me that 36 years later, house as we knew it then still would exist now, like it really, like you, the records, a lot of the records we were playing are 30 something years old. Oh, yeah. When you played Alice in Limerick last night, that was one of the biggest records of the night. Yeah, yeah that's tw 31 years old. Yeah. If anyone said that this would be a, a lasting genre, you look at punk, real punk lasted what, five years? Disco lasted what, eight years, nine years? Yeah. Um, even like, you know, the funk sound lasted a short period of time. House music is still here 36 years later and has a gazillion subgenres within it. So we now we have classical, we have rock and roll, we have blues, we have jazz, we have house. You know, it's really a thing. <laughs> so I just wanted to end on that. I'm just, I feel so fortunate that a gazillion years later to be able to still be doing it. Still getting phone calls. So. Incredible story and moving and true. Everything's true. You know, we got the, the moment like in Bronx Tale, remember when they all walked in and, you know, the, the, Don, Corley, the Don guy said to everybody, I'm going to ask you to leave once. I'm going to ask you the same way. You're going to have to all leave. <laughs> and you refuse. Andy's going to lock that door. <laughs> But what we're going to do is we're not going to throw you a beating. So that ends we're this, beat you it's an amazing, you. this is, I'm so glad I was able to get a chance to um, replay this live performance that we all did at Vocal Beat, Vocal Booth Weekend in Alicante. So on that note, thanks to Andy Ward for doing such a great thing, getting me the video, of course, organizing a fantastic few days out there in Alicante. Victor Simonelli, Brooklyn Zone, Chicago Zone, Maurice Joshua Giant himself, Eric Cupper, out in New York, he lives in Connecticut now. I mean, amazing, you, you heard his story. And Claudio Pazivanti, Sunlight Square. Take care, everyone. Have a good night. See you all very soon. And we have some amazing guests lined up. Ciao. And stay blessed. <laughs>